This is Johnny Swinger, and you are in the Wrestling Epicenter, so don't sing it. Swing it. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Hey, this is Buzz Bagwell, and guess what? You're listening to the Interactive Interview. Welcome to another edition of Interactive Wrestling Radio, right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. My name is James Walsh, and this week we're going to bring you an exclusive interview with the gentleman who last joined us over 15 years ago, back in 2004, when we had Johnny Swinger on the show to promote Impact Wrestling. That was way back then. Now he's on to promote UCW Summer Slamboree. Kind of a combination of two pay-per-view names there. I kind of dig that. Summer Slam and Slamboree, the great WCW pay-per-view. Too bad they don't do a battle bowl. That'd be kind of cool, right? That event will be available on Fight TV pay-per-view, so make sure you check out Fight TV and get yourself UCW Summer Slamboree featuring Johnny Impact, PJ Black, Two guys together again from the Worldwide Underground, as well as, of course, our guest of the week, Johnny Swinger. Enjoyed doing a little bit of a talking segment last week, guys. It was a lot of fun to um, get to talk and give them a little bit of opinions on what's going on in the world of wrestling right now. I'm going to do it right now, solo, at Patrick last week, but I wanted to kind of weigh in on my thoughts as we head into a fantastic new era of wrestling that's going to start October 2nd when AEW debuts on Wednesday nights on TNT. I remember September 4th, 1995 as a red-letter day for professional wrestling and really of my childhood. I was just about to turn 14 years old and WCW Monday Nitro debuted on TNT kind of set the wrestling world on its ear because it was going to go head-to-head with Raw. Now, here we are. Gosh, we're 24 years later, uh, just uh, just shy of a month after 24 years later, and on Wednesday night, not head-to-head with anything unless you count NXT, you have AEW making its debut and really giving us a large-scale secondary wrestling product that we've desired, we've needed, the kick in the pants to the wrestling industry that we've needed for almost two decades now. I said last week that I am all in. I know that's cute because that was the original pay-per-view name that kind of spawned this whole thing becoming a thing, but I definitely am all in on AEW. There's things they need to work on. They need to work on the star chasing They don't need to worry about what Dave Meltzer gives it star-wise every match. And it's okay for the guy who's going to main event the next month's pay-per-view to face a mid-carter at best and beat them in four minutes. We don't need 19 minutes. Ultimately, AEW cannot and should not be New Japan Pro Wrestling done in the U.S. If that's what it is... You're not going to get Mr. and Mrs. Walmart to watch. It's going to be different. It's not going to be like WWE. It really shouldn't be like WWE. But it needs to appeal to some of those WWE fans because our market, our fan base is needing to conglomerate around this. And we can't just have the the rebel yell, more, more, more. I don't know why I'm qu- quoting Billy Idol here. We need to have things that is going to incorporate everybody and bring everybody in and present a new wrestling show in a different way. AEW, October 2nd. The rules are about to change again. Anyway, I want to wish everybody a great weekend ahead. Remember to check out UCW. Summer Slamboree on Fight TV. And I thank Johnny Swinger for joining us for this interview. And I hope you all check out the pay-per-view this weekend from UCW. This is Glenn Gilberti, currently on Impact Wrestling, 
on Lions, Tigers, Bears, and Disco on the Russo brand, and Keep It at 100 with Conan, two great podcasts, formerly the Disco Inferno, and you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. Boom. Available now in the archives of interactivewrestlingradio.com and wrestlingepicenter.com. It's our exclusive, critically acclaimed interview with Rosemary. Including when she had high praise for the Monster Abyss. One of our immediate favorites that kept us watching TNA when we first started watching was the Monster Abyss. And somebody we very much adored watching him on TV and watching his work and watching his character so to be brought in now 2016 into impact dressing and to be paired with somebody that we adored so much and looked up to and considered a hero perhaps somebody that we very much loved watching his work and, and being and being partnered with him is an absolute dream come true to do, to not mince words be sure and check out the archives of InteractiveWrestlingRadio.com and the Wrestling Epicenter, featuring our interview archives dating back to 2002. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. On the Newsmaker line with me right now is a gentleman who will be one of the featured stars on Summer Slamboree. So you've probably seen the poster on Facebook. We've shared it on Wrestling Epicenter's Facebook page as well. He is a guy who hasn't joined us on our show in literally over 15 years. But welcome back, Johnny Swinger. Mr. Swinger, are you with me? Yes, sir. James, how are you? Doing good. It's such a pleasure to have you on, man. And uh, your name has come up a lot recently we had glenn gilberti on to promote his match with scarlet bordeaux on impact and he name dropped you a couple times about podcasts and things so definitely wanted to have you on well so he's back to wrestle the women again huh is that what you just said <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had it was probably back in april or so but there you go um so let's talk a little bit about what's happening this weekend because you're still actively out there on the independent circuit and this show is stacked you got uh, some of the guys from Lucha Underground and Impact Wrestling, and of course yourself, some big, really big names appearing for Summer Slamboree. Yes, it's uh, UCW Universal Championship Wrestling. It's uh, I would have to say it's probably one of the longest running uh, independents out there. I mean, he's, it's been running since 2004, I believe. I did the actual first show uh, outside Greenville, South Carolina, and Ronnie Gossett, he's a great promoter, and uh, he works real hard to he gets out there and to the grassroots, you know, and talks to the people and, and draws up interest in every town we go to. And it's a, it's a really good production. He's got, you know, light, smoke, entranceway, you know, everything. Meet and greets before the show. He really does a great job. Absolutely. And I saw the match you had with Scott Steiner there a couple of years back, about a year and a half back, I guess. And that was a lot of fun to watch. So, man, it is uh, it is a good show. I encourage people to check out UCW. Yeah, it's actually, it brings back the memories of the old WCW days. The shows are very reminiscent, and uh, besides having the actual people like Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner, we had Nick Patrick as a referee and Ernest the Cat Miller, so a lot of the shows feel like WCW reunions, and I still think there's a lot of fans out there that remember that era and appreciate it and want to come out and see it again, so that's what we're uh, giving to them. Absolutely. And and I will pick your brain a little bit about wrestling and where we're at right now with the uh, the changing tides that you can kind of feel in the air right now with wrestling, including the announcement that was made today uh, by by AEW, of course, I'm referring to. But we'll get to that later on. Um, I wanted to ask you for, from from your side of things, because I know you were part of Raven's podcast and I know you do stuff with with Glenn and all that. Do you enjoy getting on there and doing some smart wrestling talk? Or is this something that, you know, what? because as a guy who's been doing this before it was the end thing to do, I kind of wonder what the guys think about getting out there and talking about this stuff as openly as you guys do on, you know, with Vince Russo and with Glenn Gilberti and so forth. No, I, I love talking shop. I really do. Um, I still really enjoy uh, what I do. And, and like you said, it's changed, but there's still a lot of things that are still the same. I think we just kind of built on, you know, and, and then, you know, before our era, it was everything's maybe things are faster now and 
that guys do a lot more unbelievable moves. I remember wrestling Rey Mysterio in 1995, and I was like, right. how are you able to do this stuff? We'd never seen it before. He just happened to be the first guy. And now if you look at these guys, you could probably name 100 guys that can do better stuff than that. So it's just it's just more. It's just giving the people more. So we still have an audience. So it, 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 you can't argue with it, you know. And you are training guys now. Do you guys? Do you try to teach them, you know, not to do as uh, Eli Drake called it, the Cirque du Soleil wrestling, or do you try to teach them to fundamentals? You know. <laughs> well, I don't have my actual location. I did have a location for about two years, and it just became a, a big hassle with not owning the building and having someone to rent from. What I do now is more of one day seminar kind of deals where. Say I'm booked at a at a show this Saturday night. I'm not doing one this Saturday night, but a lot of times the promoter will organize a seminar, you know, from like two to five the day of the show, and then I'm there for the show. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone for me. I'm already there, and it, the guys that are on the show that night, it gives them the opportunity to get in the ring. We can actually go over stuff they're doing that night, so it makes the show better. So that's what I'm mainly doing now, as far as training guys. Um, I'm Great. getting ready to help uh rick steiner's son bronson break into the business he's been wanting to do it for a few years now he's finishing up college and uh he's going to be the next big thing he really is bronson rick steiner's steiner. son. yeah it's his son he's about six one about two. i was going to ask if he's built like his dad yeah yeah he was a high school state champion he's playing football for ksu right now he's going to be a stud man Oh, wow. Well, I'll be definitely looking out for yeah. him. That's awesome. He's going to be starting within the next six months. So, Excellent, excellent. Good. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the past, and for those who want to hear you know, the biographical stuff, our old interview is still online for those who want to go back and listen to it. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, about WCW. Um, that's mm-hmm. obviously where most people probably saw you for the first time. And I remember I saw you have matches, but it wasn't until an episode of Saturday Night when they gave you the microphone. And you really just kind of all eyes on you. It was it, you, you were the guy in the spotlight. Um, I thought when I saw that, okay, this guy, they're going to do something with him. Granted, it was Saturday night. It wasn't Nitro. It wasn't Thunder. But it still was a big deal. Um, did you think at that point that they were going to start doing something with you? Or was that kind of an audition for them to maybe start putting a little bit more shine on you? Well, I was under contract. And that was exciting enough for me to be, I was not even 22 years old when I signed the first Turner broadcasting contract for guaranteed weekly pay. And like you said, on television every week, I was blown away, lucky to have that. And I'm on television on the same shows with Macho Man and Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, and all these guys that I grew up watching. So I was just totally enthralled with that. To me, I thought that every time I went out on TV, whether it was a minute or it was nine minutes, that was an opportunity. Now, that show you're talking about, WCW Saturday Night, at the time, they called it the B or C show. But I remember the TBS ratings were 2.5, 2.7, 2.8. Now, compare Mm -hmm. that to Raw's number today. There's not much of a difference there in viewership. We really had a lot of eyes on us. And... That was that WCW period that I was there was the biggest exposure because I remember that's when I would go out in public and that's when I got recognized the most, more than when I was with ECW, more than with TNA, and even WWE. I mean, WCW, we had a big audience. Um, Absolutely. TNT, there, there was really, like I said, our lower rated shows were between two and a half to three. That's a great rating today. Right. And even even in their dying days, even in like the last shows, we're talking, you know, oh, they did a bad rating. They did a one point nine. Well, is that yeah. that far away from where we're at now? No, I mean, we're pretty I close. Know, and I just heard recently that I did this Nitro at the Georgia Dome. It was the night that uh, Goldberg that Hogan beat lost Hogan right, for the yeah. belt. At that point, that was the most watched wrestling show on cable ever. It, it's probably been beaten, but. That's quite a record for, you know, for someone to boast. Yeah, I think I made a hurt. Bischoff may have said that on, a, on one of his. But I just heard that recently that at that point, that was the most watched wrestling show on cable TV. So 
it was 97, yeah. 98, 99 was really big time. And, and that's, that's when I was there and, and we go, go to the independent shows today. I, I do a lot of stuff with buff and people are still talking about the NWO and, you know, how big it was and sting coming down from the ceiling. You're like so many people were watching and it, it I don't think you remember. can underscore it. Cause I, I remember walking, you know, I'm from uh, northern New Jersey, not quite New York, but almost. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember going down the shore and, you know, all the stores that now have, you know, whatever the hot thing is in their in their thing. They all had Sting shirts, NWO shirts, mm-hmm. uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin shirts, even some ECW shirts. So mm-hmm. wrestling was, I don't think people understand, it was no, not counterculture. It was pop culture in the mm-hmm. late 90s, for sure. Yeah, it, re- it really was a hot time. And uh I, just, I don't know if we'll ever see it that big again, but and it was it's some great memories though. It really was. And I had, at that time I had the friends up with WWF with uh, edge and Christian and they were doing that brood thing. And, and they were, both sides were doing fantastic. in that, that three year time period. It was just a I wanted to ask to you. Wrestling. Absolutely. You had a, a contract and I've talked to a lot of guys who were under contract in WCW that, you know, some of them you didn't even really see. Like Lanny Poffo, yeah. I think, said he was under contract for four years and they never, ever, ever, ever used him once. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Scott Putsky, another great talent, but never he really featured that bit. heavily. I'll tell you one thing. I was at, we were at TV one day. At, we were doing the syndicated tapings in Universal Studios. This is probably 98, 99. And I'm standing back there with Lenny Lane. And when we did those TVs, almost the entire company was there for that three, four days of TV. And I saw this guy standing back there. He, he looked like he was about 6'5", about 320, had a beard like Santa Claus. I said to Lenny <laughs> Lane, I was talking, I was like, God, who is that guy? He's a monster. He goes, Swinger, that's Nails. I said, what do you mean Nails? Like Kevin Kelly from WWF Nails? He goes, yeah. I said, when did he sign here? He goes, oh, he's been under contract for about three years. That was the first <laughs> and only time we ever saw Kevin. He was at, came to one TV taping at Universal. And that just, just we're like, wow, how, I didn't even know the guy was in the, we saw guys who didn't even know they were in the company. And then he goes, well, right. you don't want to know what he's making either. I said, no, no, I don't want to know. <laughs> and that was, um, well, that's, he was one of the Minnesota guys that, uh, Kurt Hennig was, was a super guy that took care of all his friends, man. They were all there. Wayne Blue, Mike Enos, stuff. Uh, John Nord, Barry Darso, they were all there. But uh, never saw Kevin just that one time. Absolutely. That's incredible. And and that's kind of what I was getting at is they had perhaps the best roster ever Mm -hmm. assembled in wrestling right there. And and it just seemed like they just couldn't – they couldn't find a place to fit all the pieces Mm -hmm. into the pegs, the pegs into the holes. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, there's a thing said that people would say too big to fail. That's kind of what we were. We were so big, but it does fail after a while. It's just oversaturation with Monday Nitro, Thursday Thunder, two hours of Saturday night, syndicated shows on the weekends. There was so much on TV that it just numbed the people. That To me, the guys became lesser stars because they were too available. And then our live events really plummeted because of that. And it's like, well, who wants to go pay to see a live event when you got you know, Goldberg and Hogan on Monday night for free. We'll, we can throw a party and we don't have to pay nothing, you know? <laughs> so I think that really, I mean, think about it. I, if I just said July of 98 was the most watched show ever on cable to what, three years later and it's gone. That, that was the, right. the free fall from that night on. We couldn't do anything bigger than that. So everything was down downhill real fast after that. Very cool. Now I mentioned that I'm a Northeast guy, so I kind mm-hmm. of, saw the inception of ECW and saw what it became and by the time you came around it was really well established and, and doing big houses yeah. uh, what was the big difference did you feel uh, obviously other than the wrestling style what was the big difference between working for a company like WCW and working for ECW I remember watching ECW we all used to watch it you can ask Glenn this when we were in WCW we used to watch ECW at midnights on like the Sunshine Network and we used to watch it like, oh, my God, these guys are crazy, and we'll never work there. Ha, 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 right? right. <laughs> so, <laughs> one, like I said, once I saw how good my friends were doing WWF, and I'd been in WCW a few years, and like you said, they didn't at that point, they weren't really giving me big opportunities. I really wanted to go up there. So 
Raven, who I was good friends with, he's like, you should go to ECW for a while. I was like, no, I wouldn't fit in there at all. He goes, no, you would. And I didn't get what he was saying, but I did ask for release from WCW with the intention of going right to WWF. Mm -hmm. It it got stretched out to a point where it was about five or six months, and they still hadn't hired me. And that's when I called Raven. I said, hey, you think Paulie would take a look at me? So he set it up. He set, set up for me to go in there for like a tryout. I think it might have been in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Poughkeepsie, one of their main towns. So Paulie's like, yeah, we'll give you a shot. Puts me out there in the first match with, I think, little Guido. As soon as I walked through the curtain, the people went nuts because I was a recognizable WCW wrestler, which they hate. They hated (laughs) WCW and WWF wrestlers. We were the evil villains. So I had a massive response. I had a good match with Guido, and I came to the back, and I had a job because of that. And I was like, whoa, this might be really good. And uh, boom, I took. I was there for three, four months, and then they put me with Simon Diamond. And, man, we were, we were at a big tag team there for, for the entire summer, of, I think, like 2000. And it was just a great time. And, and I knew that as I was climbing there, I would always have somewhere to go after that. So it was a real good – and like you said uh, – the, actually, the house is the last year of the company. They were the biggest they ever were. They were the biggest gates we Absolutely. ever did. And all the big, uh, we did 6,000 people in Toronto, 6,000 in L.A. We were running Chicago, Dallas, all these national company for that last year. Um, but we don't know. You know, I mean, no, to this day, nobody knows exactly what happened, how that deal got brokered with yeah. Vince. But that. It was a real fun man, oh man. though, you know, just a lot of opportunity there to be thing. You know what I mean? Not a lot of restraints and, you know, you could be a little freer with your, your promos and your matches. And, you know, if you went over time, you didn't, you know, WCW, man, you'd get chewed out if you went over 30 seconds because it was a live TV show. You know what I mean? They had mm-hmm. to go to commercials and stuff, whereas ECW was post-produced. And Paul E looked at it like, man, if it's good, we're going to find a way to air it. So it was a really cool place to be. Absolutely, absolutely. And you and Simon, you traveled over to Impact Wrestling for a little yeah. while there, and you were guys a real tag team. You guys were, yeah. you know, you don't see that nowadays where guys travel beyond company lines and stay together as a tag team, unless they're brothers, maybe. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that was it. It was really cool to see you guys do that. Um, did I guess my thought question would be thoughts on working with Simon? Oh, we became friends right away within within the first couple months of working together. Um, I'm trying to think back. You said it was so long ago. It was 20 years ago almost. And <laughs> let's put it this way. We got together in May or June of 2000, and I got married at the end of 2000. He was in my wedding already. He was already one of my best wow. friends within six months there. And, man, we just... We stuck together, and when would I say the nuclear war of wrestling went off in 2001, where you know ECW and WCW <laughs> dropped at the same time? We're, we're I'm sitting here in my mid 20s, going, "Oh my gosh, I think it's over, right?" And then, but we stuck together, and we we capitalized on that ECW exposure in the Northeast, doing a lot of independence, and then I did my stuff in the South by myself, and I kept busy until the TNA opened up, and. uh and we got in there, and we we didn't win there for a couple shows, and Jeff Jarrett wasn't totally sold on us, but an opportunity came up, and we and we came in there. Uh, Scott Demore, who's in charge mm-hmm. of Impact right now, was there back then, who's also a friend of mine too from day one. Uh, he uh, he brought us in for the program with America's Most Wanted. Boom, man, we just started having great matches with those guys. And next thing you know, we're the tag team champions. So it's Great run there, too. It was pretty gritty. I remember you had a burst appendix and you were working the next week. That's That's pretty insane. Yeah, it really (laughs) is. Well, man, that's we. at least I was and even Simon, too. We came into that. You know, if you can breathe, you can get into the ring and do it. You know, because we were figured and the company had money and promotion into us. And you don't take a week off. You don't take two weeks off. You just find a way to do it. And, uh, you know, you just... uh, you just got to go in there and get it done. And it, that's the guys still have, I think, the mentality of that today is, man, you deal with your, your thing uh, when your day's off. You know, but when you got to be on, you got to be on. Absolutely. Uh, I told you I was going to pick your brain a little bit. This is kind of where we're at now with the uh, question is, you mentioned Scott Demore being in charge of Impact, and Impact is 
It's the same company, but it's not the same company. It's a totally different place than it was in different incarnations over the years. What do you think of where they are at now? I know you haven't been there in a little while, but what do you think of where they're at? Well, like I said, me and Scott go back to, oh gosh, my first year in wrestling, I, was, I started out in Winnipeg, Canada with these Arctic tours, and, and he called me at the hotel. I never met him before, and he said, would you like to do TV for WCW? And that's how I met Scott. He's the one that got me booked in WCW the first time. So we've been friends all the way back till then, and then he was a big proponent of me and Simon when we came into TNA um, with, with the great promotion we got there. And now as we speak, he's the, him and Don Callis are both in charge of impact. And I, I still follow, you know, what's going on. And I was there last October for a couple shows and I was real impressed, you know, with the talent he has. And, um, it reminds me a lot of ECW, you know what I mean? Like the production and mm-hmm. it's, it's not overproduced. I don't want to say Vince is overproduced, but it's, it's got a lot of, you know, that, people want to see wrestling you know what i mean so i'll I say it's really, overproduced <laughs> yeah i think i think the impact guys are getting it like these aew guys let's feature the talent and let's what? let the talent draw the people and not blow so much money on smoke and mirrors and fireworks and all this stuff that people don't care about any of that stuff they just want to want to see the talent so um i think impact is still viable um just i still keep in touch with scott we talk all the time and uh and uh, Don Callis, he was the booker for Winnipeg when I started. So he started, I did my first match under him. So the, you can have two better guys. And I think they take a lot of advice from the talent, which I think was a big thing with Heyman and Dreamer running ECW. They took advice. See, the wrestlers know how to portray their character. So just let them do it. You know what I mean? Like, take their ideas. Like you said, pick their brain instead of hiring a writer to come up with stuff for a guy, you know what I mean? Just let the guys come up with their own mm-hmm. stuff. That's the way it was always done. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we mentioned TNT, you mentioned AEW. The, t- the announcement today was that October 2nd, they're live on Wednesday nights and they're going to be live and they're going to be playing arenas. And it's pretty insane to think that, um, a guy named TJ Perkins, we did an interview with him. He said, basically, AEW has given us, to some extent, WCW back. How do you feel about AEW's birth? It is very similar, especially with TNT. I mean, that was the deal, right? Nitro every week. Um, that is a huge deal. And I just heard about that before before we started talking, that they just made yeah. that announcement. And I, I think it's huge. Um, where everybody knows who the backing is behind it. It's not some fly by night, uh, operation. So, uh, Hey, you're talking about the talent. They got the talent, they got the backing and now they got the network. I mean, that's, that's got some serious legs to it more than anything that's come up in the last 20 years. So, um, it, it, everything points to it being a huge success. So. So probably a stupid question, but any interest in, in seeing what they would be interested in somebody like you? Any interest in going to AEW or oh, Impact? For sure. I work full time. I still wrestle every weekend. And, uh, man, I just turned 44, and I'm more in demand at 44 than I was at 34. So I don't think I've become better. I just think that the business has, has got wrestling has gotten bigger. You know what I mean? Like, now there's another major national serious network deal out there you know and an impact is on every week and i'm like wow this is uh this could be the the beginning of a new you know uh what do we call it peak right of the business right. and uh man i feel good i'm not hurt i'm not you know i'm not hiding injuries so uh yeah i'm open to any and all offers um for right now ucw keeps you busy uh, in the southeast and uh i i got at least a dozen great promoters that I've been working for over the last 12, 13 years that always bring me back. And, you know, it's never a one shot. Okay. We had him. Who's the next guy. So got got a lot of great people I'm working with right now. Awesome. Awesome. Kind of a silly question, maybe like a Frank Sinatra thing here going, but any regrets when you look back so far at your career? Oh gosh, not at all. No, I mean, that's all. I, I don't want to say I planned it out perfectly, but it's, you know, I envisioned a really long career. So, I mean, man, I'm at 25, 26 years now. And uh, when I see the Rock and Roll Express 
and these <laughs> bullet Bob Armstrong out there. I just, wow, you really can do this forever if you do it the right way, you know? So Exactly. Uh, now I'm, I'm still driving with the Steiner brothers, you know what I mean? So it's like, man, you can, you know, if you do this right, you really could stick with it and, and have a good time with it and continue to make some money on it. Yeah, I mean, I, it's crazy. When you say things like, I've been wrestling 25 years, I, I remember mm-hmm. my age. I'm th- I'm going to be 38 in, in, uh, oh, in uh, September, and I'm like, man, I, you know, it's it's yeah. crazy to think that the guys that I consider the younger guys <laughs> are, um, are you know, the veterans now. And the, right. and the older guys, they're still around, too. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I, it's, it's amazing how much time uh, goes by, you know. And uh, But, no, I'm grateful for all of it and all. You know, I got some great opportunities along the way, and I'm still getting them. You know what I mean? I'm still taking bookings on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, all oh, the internet, I said, you know, the internet helps us. The WWE network helps all of us. You know what I mean? Um, we got, there's always going to be another generation of kids that are going to watch and come out to the shows. And all they can do is press a button on their phone. They know who we all are. So it's, uh, that's right. It, it's a good deal. All right, so we did the almost the whole interview, and I didn't even ask you about your your time in WWE, which actually happened after our interview, you know, fifteen plus years ago. Um, what did you think of your time in WWE? I've heard you say in prior interviews that <laughs> you don't really get the opportunity to breathe when you're working there. You pretty much are, are under their watch. <laughs> well, everything they always told me even when I started timing is everything, and I just when I went there in 2005. It's just, just my own personal. I just got lost in the shuffle there, and they just they had other people they wanted to do stuff with. And it's such a it was such a big outfit that you just get lost in the place. And uh, but uh, I don't regret going there because being a WWE wrestler is a is the best label you can have on your resume. You know what I mean? It's just just there's no as of right now there's no bigger value than being an a WWE wrestler at some point in your life. It's, you know, like saying you're in the NFL as opposed to the CFL. You know what I mean? It's just exactly um, until AEW gets bigger and even ECW and TNA, while they were national, there still weren't the WWF or even WCW. Those were the, really the two major leagues, right? In the last 30 years. And uh, I, I'm looking at it like the territories again. Like I'm looking at Impact and AEW, and there's there's some other ones out there too. Uh, Full Impact Pro. There's one in Florida. You know, there's these. Uh, what's the one out in LA? Uh, Pro Wrestling Gorilla. I think it's like Pro Wrestling Gorilla. Yeah. Territories. Yeah. There's like territories again. Like there's going to be, you know, a dozen or so places that are really viable at at um, you know drawing money, drawing a uh, thousand, fifteen hundred people. You know, that's that's business. You know, that's, that's some people are making money. The top wrestlers are making money in those groups. Absolutely. There's Vegas is hot too. I mean, Vegas, you know, with Glenn out there, you, you know, Vegas yeah. is very hot with uh, future stars. So lots yeah. of great stuff happening all over. All right, man. Well, before I let you go, do you mind if I ask for a favor? Sure. Um, I guess my question was going to be, would you mind giving me a line or just saying this is Johnny Swinger and you're in the wrestling epicenter. This is Johnny Swinger, and you are in the Wrestling Epicenter, so don't sing it. Swing it. All right, man. I wish you the best of luck. I'm looking forward to this weekend and seeing you at the Summer Slamboree. Sounds like a lot of fun, and uh, I'll make sure. You can get it on pay-per-view on Fight TV if you can't get there live, so there's a way to check it out, and uh, it's going to be a heck of a show. Looking forward to it. I will get a link up there so people can find it on Fight, and I really appreciate you taking the time and doing this with me today, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, James. You take care, sir. I'll see you on Facebook. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Bye-bye.